Hello and thanks for joining us again. In this video we're going to be making an under the sea collage. There is really so much going on in this video and it's suitable for children and adults. All ages can enjoy this and will enjoy this. Um, I've been doing this with my 16 year old and my 8 year old and my 4 year old and myself, I won't tell you how old I am, We've all enjoyed it thoroughly. It's really, really good fun. So we're going to start off by creating papers, textured papers that we can then use to create our collages. Now, of course, you can just use colored paper that you might have at home, but where's the fun in that? It's much better to create your own. Um, and particularly by adding lots of texture and lots of marks, there are so many skills that we will cover in this video, which are fundamental skills for all artists to develop. I'm going to be using all these individual pieces that I've cut out to create an under the sea stop motion animation. So if you'd like to do that, make sure that you don't stick anything down onto your collage, but still go through all the same processes and you can actually create a collage at the end when you've finished with your animation. If you watch to the end of the video, you'll be able to see a little example of the animation that I've started so far. So you can use um, any type of paint you like. For this example that you can see on the table, I've actually used acrylic paint and I happen to have some really nice metallic paints and some pearlized paints which is fantastic uh, for this type of collage because it just gives the creatures a nice sort of shiny iridescent feel. But for this tutorial, I'm just going to be using poster paint, which works just as well. And that's perhaps something that you're more likely to have at home. You could use really anything that you can lay your hands on. So I'm just going to show you some samples of papers that we're going to learn how to make. So we're going to have a background like this one with bubble wrap. We're going to have some paper where we've scratched into the surface, some sort of stippled effects and some stenciling. We're going to be doing a bit of dry brushing and printmaking with found objects that we've got at home. So the idea is to build up a bank of papers that you can then draw upon to collage with. So you've got plenty to play around with. So you can see here the equipment that I would suggest you pause the video in a minute and go and have a look for. So I'm just going to be using things that you're likely to have at home. I have, as you can probably imagine, drawers full of absolute tat that I use for mark making myself and in my lessons, but I am really trying to just use things that you'll have at home in this video. So an old washing up sponge is perfect. Cut it down, cut it in half or in thirds. Make sure it's got a scourer one side. It doesn't matter if it's really worn and used, that's fine. I'm going to be using an old nail brush and an old toothbrush. Either one of those is fine. Some old decorating brushes or big paint brushes, preferably ones that have got stiff bristles and a comb. So you might have a, a plastic comb or a fork, something like that will be fine. And then I want you to try and find some things around the house that you can stencil with. So this is an old net from a bag of lemons. I have various bits of you know, fabric, bits of lace. You might have something on an old item of clothing that's no longer wanted that you could then cut up and repurpose for this. So a bit of old neck curtain that I've got. Anything with holes, empty spaces that you can stencil through is perfect. I'm also going to be using some bubble wrap. Um, and if you've got a roller, that's great. If not, you don't need a roller. Um, a rolling pin as well if you've got one. So this is the first page that we're going to make and it's going to be the background for our collage. So I'm going to use cartridge paper, that's best if you've got it. Um, you know, any paper will do. 
sometimes even things like uh, lining paper, if you buy that from B&Q or from Wilco's, that's perfect to use as well because it's cheap and you can get a big roll. I'm going to have an A3 background and then I'm going to do each sheet of colour and mark making on A4. So to start off with, we're going to make the background. So I'm using my A3 paper and I'm going to be printing with bubble wrap. So it will look something like this example here. So if you've got enough bubble wrap, as big as the paper, that's great. If not, fast forward a little bit and I'll show you a technique where you can wrap it round a rolling pin and it uses a lot less bubble wrap and it's great for younger children. I just personally prefer to use a big sheet to print with because I enjoy that process a bit more. So on your palette, it's best to use a plate. A paper plate is ideal or a plastic plate. I just want you to squeeze out some blue paint. If you've got um, light blue and dark blue, that's great, or blue and white, but you just need blue and white on your palette. That's all you need. So I've got my bubble wrap, which is the same size as the paper. And I'm just going to take a decorator's brush, making sure that I've got the bumpy textured surface facing up. So that's the bit I'm going to paint on. And I'm just going to whack some paint on there. I'm not going to be too careful or precious about this. Just try to cover it and work quite quickly because you want to print while the paint is still wet. So some areas the paint is quite thick and dense and they will come out a bit darker on the page and that's fine. So once you've covered the bubble wrap, leave it in place and place your paper over the top. And then you can just rub on the back of the paper don't push down so hard that you pop the bubbles, as tempting as that might be. Just rub your hand over the back of the paper. If you've got a roller, you could use a roller. If you've got a rolling pin, you could use that if you want to, but there's really no need. Your hands do the job perfectly well. Once you feel you've applied an even pressure all over the back, then peel the paper off the bubble wrap and have a look at what you've got. There we are, that's perfect for the first layer. Don't worry if some bits are dark and dense, that's the kind of effect you want. You don't want it to be completely even throughout. And we're gonna build this up with probably about five layers, so a lot of that will be covered over towards the end. So again, I'm going to paint on, I might use some paler blue now, maybe starting to mix the tones of blue onto the bubble wrap laying the same paper back over and printing again. Now you'll notice that I haven't really gone around the edges at this point, but I do want to cover the whole sheet of paper. So I'm gonna make sure with this next layer that I'm actually putting lots of paint around the edges of the bubble wrap and making sure everything is covered. So just keep going with this process until you've got an outcome that you're happy with. I would suggest you want to cover the whole page and you want to have just a minimal bit of white showing. But really, it's up to you. You just stop when you're ready. Okay, so I think that's probably okay for mine. I'm happy with that. So as I said, if you haven't got a lot of bubble wrap, you can just wrap a little bit around a rolling pin and then just cut that off and tape that in place. I put a little bit of tape at the top and the bottom. And then you can just use your paintbrush to paint directly on the bubble wrap. And then you can just roll your rolling pin across the paper. So that's just another technique that you can use if you want to. So we're now going to make the first of our textured papers for our sea creatures that we're going to collage. So for this one, I'm going to use the same palette that I had before, so the blues and the whites, and I'm just going to add some yellow paint. 
and we're going to be creating a sort of bluey green page and we're going to use an old nail brush or a toothbrush and I'm going to scratch it across making these sorts of scratchy lines and then some stippled marks over the top. So I prefer the nail brush because I like to hold it in my hand firmly but you can use a toothbrush if you want to. Don't forget we're just sticking to the blues and the yellows on this palette and a bit of white. Okay what I want you to try and do when you're creating this page is to mix your colours on the page. I don't want you to mix up a green on the palette and then apply it. I really want you to explore the different tones and shades of green that you can create by mixing your colours directly on the page. So I'm going to start off just with some dark blue and if you watch how I'm applying the paint you'll see that I am just brushing quite lightly. I'm not pushing too hard so you really need to practice how much pressure you need to apply to create these types of marks. Now I'm going to start to add some yellow and sort of hatch and cross hatch so the paint is mixing to create these beautiful tones. So I'm just creating one type of mark really which is this scratching. Once I've covered the page with that I'm going to then do some stippled marks over the top. So I'm taking some dark blue paint, you'll see I'm taking a bit of the excess off on the palette and then in a quite brisk up and down motion I'm making stippled marks so I'm printing just with the bristles of the brush. Again I'm going to use some other colours, I'm going to use some yellows and blues and whites covering most, well covering the whole page actually and leaving only a little bit of white and then you'll have an effect that looks something like this. So the next paper moving on we're going to be using um, red and yellow so you're going to need another plate. Don't use the same palette, please have a separate plate for these colours. We're going to be creating a sort of stippled effect using a sponge and perhaps a little bit of a sort of swirly scratchy mark, you can just see a bit in the corner here. So for this I'm just using an old washing up sponge that's been cut up and I'm only going to be using the scourer side and in your palette just red, yellow and white. So I'm going to dip it in the paint and you'll see I'm taking off the excess on the palette before I start to apply it on the page and I'm just dabbing it on the paper really lightly. I'm going to build this up slowly over time with lots and lots of layers. Now particularly if you're doing this with younger children sometimes they tend to dip the sponge right in the paint and then push quite hard and you get these really dark dense areas don't think oh no that's ruined it's all part of the overall look it's absolutely fine it's nice to have some areas that are darker and denser than others equally well when it's a bit drier you can actually go over it with other colors um, and break up those areas if you feel that they're too solid and too dark so again i'm mixing my colors on the page i'm going to be creating lots of lovely orange tones by adding the yellow on top of the red and then I've got a nice mix of marks and tones on the paper so you can see it looks something like this. So again those areas where we push too hard if you don't like those you can perhaps go back over with some white just make sure it's dry really before you do it I'll just break up those patches a little bit it's important to remember that we're not just creating a piece of work here that's going to be left as a whole sheet of paper. We're going to be cutting into these papers. We're going to be cutting out shapes, fish, submarines, various other creatures. So it doesn't matter if there's certain areas of the sheet that you're not happy with. You can just use the parts that you are. And you'll be surprised that when you actually cut it up, um, which bits look the best. So another technique we're going to use with the scourer, I'm going to have hardly any paint 
on the scourer and I'm going to use my hand in a circular motion to create these really sort of fine circular marks. Hopefully you can see those with the camera. Now again, if you go in a bit heavy handed and you push the sponge right down, you'll end up with solid areas rather than light swirly marks. Again, don't think, oh no, this is a nightmare. I'm gonna to have to start this whole page again. It's absolutely fine. Just carry on, let it dry. You can work back over the top with another color. And actually those bits will probably look really beautiful when you cut them out and collage with them later on. So just keep going in a light swirly motion. Try to cover up most of the white, but leave some little bits of white showing. And then you'll have a page that looks something like this. So you've got these really light swirly marks. Again, you can combine it though. You don't have to do stippled one side and swirly the other. Really play around. So for the next paper that we're going to create, we're going to make a sort of purpley sheet and we're going to use a fork or a comb um, and possibly the toothbrush as well. So I'm going back to the blue palette that I had earlier and I'm going to add some red paint and white. Pretend the yellow's not there. Don't go near the yellow. Just keep that to one side. So I'm just going to get a decorator's brush or a big paintbrush, anything you've got at home, and I'm just going to start whacking the paint on there. Again, I'm mixing the colours on the page. So I'm taking bits of blue and bits of red and working over the top. You can do sort of smooth strokes or you can go round in a circular motion or a bit of everything. But you have to work quite quickly because we're going to actually scratch into the paint while it's wet. I'm adding a little bit of white. Now I actually really like this page just as it is and if I wasn't doing this for a tutorial I would probably leave that and I would just collage with that directly. But just to show you another technique of what you can do when the paint is wet is you can actually scratch patterns into it with something like a fork or a comb. You can be quite neat with the patterns if you want to or you can be quite crazy and make them all overlap. If you haven't got those things to hand, you can just use the end of a paintbrush to actually scratch marks into the wet paint. That works just as well. I have these combs for marbling, which are quite nice because they've got lots of teeth on them and you can create big patterns. I like to overlap it all and make it look a bit like a net. This is just starting to remind me of Spider-Man now, for some reason. It looks like a kind of the fabric that Spider-Man would make his costume from. So if you want to add another layer, you could use an old toothbrush to flick some paint on. And then you're going to end up with a page that will look something like this. Again, don't worry about the page working as a whole because we're going to be cutting out sections and collaging with it. So moving on to the next technique and this one is going to be stenciling with found objects. So again, I'm going to be using a sponge. You could use uh, just a washing up sponge if you've got something that's perhaps a bit denser and flatter, like this round sponge that I've got, then that's perfect to use as well. And I have really limited what I'm using in this tutorial. As I said, I have boxes and boxes of things, but you'll, I'm sure you'll find some bits at home that you can use. You just want things that have got spaces between them so you can create these sorts of nice patterns and textures. This one here I've used the lace. I've actually got like a pinky green colour underneath and then I've printed the lace in a white paint. The nets from fruit are perfect. So I'm sure you'll find something at home. 
So when you're stenciling, it's really important to try and hold the stencil flat to the paper and in one position. However, if it smudges a bit and if it moves, don't worry about it. But I'm just using my hand to stretch the net out and then I'm going to put a bit of paint on the sponge and just push it up and down in a straight motion. You really want to keep um, your brush. You might have like a stippling brush or a stenciling brush that you could use that's got a flat end, but a sponge is perfect. I'm now going to print with a bit of the lace. So I'm just going to apply some paint with a sponge and lay that over the top. You can just push this down with your hands or if you've got a roller or a rolling pin, you could try that. And it's actually quite nice to print several times without applying more paint and then you get different sorts of effects. So I'm going to carry on building up this page, um, playing around with stenciling different objects. So I'm using a bit of this old net curtain here. Again, I'm mixing my colors on the page as I go. Starting to overlap bits that I've done before with another color so you can still see those patterns coming through. And you can see how this page is starting to look. And actually it would look really, really nice um, for fish it looks really good it's getting a really good sort of scaly effect so if you want something like this lacy effect where I've printed with white you can paint um, on the page directly so I'm just going to paint sort of some pinky peachy orangey tones so I'm keeping this whole page a similar sort of color or similar tones. And then I'm going to apply some white paint to the lace and print that over the top. And this is just really beautiful. It's, it might be hard to see on the camera, but it's really subtle. Really beautiful, fine texture. So if you've got something with tiny holes like that, it's better to actually ink that up and print with it rather than stencil through it. So I'm just gonna carry on with that page. I've got some darker areas and lighter areas, a real mix of different patterns and textures going on, which is gonna look amazing when I cut it out later on. So moving on to our next technique, I really want, um, quite a bright yellow page. So I'm just gonna be using mainly yellow and white and I'm gonna use cardboard here. So this is great, you can use it in all sorts of ways. I'm going to be um, painting with it and also printing with the cardboard. So I'm just gonna start off by loading up some yellow paint and literally just dragging it across the page. It's just such a nice, satisfying thing to do. You can overlap areas to make denser areas of color and I quite like the fact it's just picking up on the corner of the red in the palette and leaving red patches. So you could use the thin end of the cardboard to print with. I'm just going to dip it in a little bit of red and do some really subtle printing in the corner. Um, you can actually see like the corrugated pattern going through. You could make it um, more prominent if you want. So a bit more paint and push a bit harder and then maybe smear back over the top. So I could stop there, but you know, sometimes I don't know when to stop. So I think I might add some finger painting over the top. So I'm just gonna dip my fingers in and take off some of the excess and do some crazy movements over the top. quite nice with some white finger paint over the top at the end. And then my page looks something like that. So you might notice that I used paper plates as my palettes um, and they actually look really beautiful. 
I'm not going to throw them away, I'm going to use them. I might spread some of the paint around so that I can create extra marks and patterns. And then when these are dry, I could actually collage with these. So I could have some um, thicker areas. I might cut some fish out of them. And I've just done more finger painting all over the one on the left, which actually looks like an impressionist sort of garden. So for the last technique, we're going to um, use grey sugar paper. If you don't have grey sugar paper, that's fine. You can still just use white paper, but I think it works particularly well on grey. And this is to create a paper that I'm going to use to make a whale. Now, if you did this collage for something else, this is a really nice technique for creating all sorts of animals. We often make elephants like this and rhinos, so anything with that nice sort of texture. So, to start off with, you're going to have an A4 piece of sugar paper, grey sugar paper if you've got it, and you're going to scrunch it up, or any paper that you've got, and scrunch it up into a ball in your hands quite tightly. Open it back up, and you've got some nice creases in there. Scrunch it back up again, and you'll get different creases overlapping the ones you've got. I would say do this no more than three times because the paper starts to get a bit soft and damaged. But I've really screwed it up quite tightly and I've got lots and lots and lots of creases. Then this is really important, lay it on the table and flatten it back out again with your hands. So flatten it back out into its original shape. I'm now going to show you how to use a dry brushing technique over the top of this paper. So I've got some black paint and a big stiff bristled brush like a decorator's brush and I'm taking off the excess of the paint on a spare bit of paper. That's really important that you do that. And then I'm going to hold the brush right at the end and just sort of gently brush across the top of the page. I'm not going to be pushing too hard and I'm going to make sure almost the ends of the bristles just tickle across the top of the page rather than pushing and applying thick paint. And then what's happening is the paint is just picking up all those creases and bumps and lumps where the paper's raised. And I'm going to keep going like this, building this up till it gets darker and darker because I want the page to be quite dark and I will have some patches that are really quite dark. Then I might add some white over the top, but just a little bit for, to add in another tone. And you'll find the finished result should look a little bit like this. Something else you can do when it's dry, I'll show you just on this little dry piece here, is if you wanted to add some lighter tones, you could use some chalk, but use the side of the chalk, not the end, and just gently brush over and it'll pick up those raised relief areas to look something like this. Okay, so if you've managed to do all this, you should end up with a selection of papers that look something like this. You can carry on making as many different papers and many different colours as you want. So you should have a background piece that looks something like this. Again, I've used a bigger piece, so A3. And then I've got lots of A4 papers with lots of different marks and textures. I'm even going to use the small piece of paper where I was wiping off the excess paint. I told you I like to use everything. And of course, my paper plates. If I don't use them for this project, I might use them for something else. So once your papers are fully dry, then you can start to cut out your individual elements for your collage. Now, I strongly, strongly recommend that you don't cut out one thing and glue it on, okay? You will really regret it if you do that and your final piece won't be as interesting as it could have been potentially. So you want to cut lots and lots of shapes out, keep them all and then play around with various compositions before you glue them down. So you can use um, books for inspiration for different fish. You might even want to choose a layer of the ocean and create all creatures that live in that particular layer. 
Or you might want to use a bit of artistic license like I have done and combine all sorts of things that wouldn't normally live together in the same space. So we've actually created some sheets for you that you can download and print off and I will put details of how you can get those sheets in the comments section below and on Facebook. If you've got younger children or if you don't want to make all these beautiful textured sheets you could just colour them in with colour pencil or pens and then cut them out and collage with those as they are. Or you could cut them out and use them as a template. So for example, I'm just going to cut out this sunfish. And then I'm going to choose a paper, choose an area. I particularly like that area that's got the delicate lacy bit. And I'm going to lay the sunfish on and very carefully draw around with a pencil. Don't think that I'm doing a Mr. Maker here and I'm going to waste all this paper. All of that paper that's uh, left round the sides I will use to create other things. So I'm going to cut it out once roughly but quite close to the lines so as not to waste too much paper and then cut it out neatly and I'm going to be rotating the paper rather than turning the scissors. So there you are, that's a sunfish. If you've got tracing paper, that's even better. So you could actually lay the tracing paper over. Again, be mindful that you're not wasting the tracing paper. So go right into the corner. If you've forgotten how to use tracing paper, you just draw over the image. It's better to use something like a 2B pencil if you've got it, that's a bit softer. And then choose your paper, choose an area that you want to work on turn it over so you're actually going to put your design on the reverse turn the tracing paper over and then scribble over the back you don't have to neatly draw over the lines you can just scribble over them and then that will reveal your image which you can then cut out we've even got um, a page with other bits and pieces for you to use I've cut out a submarine because I want to put um, my youngest two children in there. So I've just made them on a separate background. Now it's up to you if you want to actually stick these down into a collage. You might want to create an animation with all your individual pieces, which is what I'm going to be showing you in the video next week. So if you want to do that, um, please make sure you just keep everything in a little box or a little folder so you've got all the bits, individual bits, separately that you can animate with. But if you did want to make a collage, really play around with the composition. So start to lay out all your elements. Don't feel like you've got to use everything that you've cut out as well. Just keep going till you're happy with the composition. I've added some googly eyes here and got a little bit carried away. And then when you've got a composition that you're reasonably happy with, take a photo of it. And then you can take everything off and then play around with another composition. So just explore maybe three or four different alternatives before you settle on whichever one you want to use. And then take a photograph because when you take each bits off to glue them on, you'll forget where they went and then you could get a little bit frustrated if you just had it set up exactly how you wanted. So it's a really good idea to take a photograph. So thanks so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoy doing this. It's a really good one to do in the garden actually because it is a little bit messy, not crazy messy, but it's good to have space where you can make a little bit of mess and not worry about it. So I'd love to see what you make. Please do send us um, pictures of your finished collages. And it would be even better if you save all your pieces and make them into an animation. And then you can collage them afterwards. So I'm just going to show you a little snip of the animation that I've started to do to give you a little taster of what you could be making next week. Okay, thanks for watching and bye.